Uh, thank you, Sasha, for that intro. Uh, I am Tiffany Longworth. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a sysadmin at Puppet, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about change management for humans. Now, when I started, I'm going to, why do I like this topic so much? When I started at Puppet six years ago, uh, I wasn't a sysadmin. I was just the scheduler for the consultants, making sure they got to the client side on time with the right stuff. Uh, and I quickly automated myself into boredom. And my manager was like, hey, Tiffany, uh, you look free. Do you want to implement some software? And not knowing I was supposed to say no, I said yes. Uh, and I learned so much, much of it by accident. Uh, a lot of it after the fact, and like, what went wrong? Uh, and through all this, I've developed some really awesome emotional scars. Uh, and I would like, this is near and dear to my heart because I want to help you not get the same scars that I get. Uh, hopefully you'll have new and different and shallower scars. <laughs> so, uh, I've done a lot of changes since that first one. Some have been great successes. Others I've considered catastrophic failures. Uh, but that is working in tech. We're subject to constant change. You roll something out. Hopefully you get to iterate on it a couple times, but all too soon the business pivots onto something else and you gotta rip it out and start all over again. Now when this works, it is so good. Like your thing that you worked on is out in the world and people are like, this is making my life better. I like you, thank you for helping me. And you're like, my baby is so good. But when it doesn't work, it is the worst. The people trying to roll out the change resent the people resisting the change. The people resisting the change are wondering why these people are trying to shove something down their throats and they end up not adopting it, which means that the benefits, the change over others are going to see, don't get realized. You get a bunch of subverted processes and shadow IT, which means in 6 to 18 months you're going to have to start all over again and nobody trusts each other and everyone's exhausted. Uh, so, there are a bunch of nerds that like to study this stuff. And they have a lot of different frameworks for thinking about how to predict if a change is going to be successful or not. One of the ones that I like is about how to communicate change, and it's called the ADCO method. It's what I'm going to be using as my framework today. Uh, it stands for awareness, because if people are not aware that there's a problem, they're not going to put forth the effort to like, adopt a change. They need to desire your fix, because if they've got like, oh, no, we just duct tape it every week and nobody cares, your big heavyweight change isn't going to be adopted. They need to know how to fix it, otherwise they can't adopt your change. They need to have the ability, like maybe I know if I could just duct tape the greenhouse hole in the sky, then we'd all be fine, but I don't have the ability to duct tape the ozone. Uh, and we don't need reminders because we're human. Okay, uh, to be clear, this talk is not about forcing a change onto someone. Uh, a bad change is going to be a bad change. Uh, we do not yet live in the dystopia where you can force push directly into someone's skull. Uh, so this talk is about how to roll out the right change in a way that people will go, oh, this is the right change. Alright. Okay, so the first thing, and personally my favorite part of change, is before you even really get going, you should hold stakeholder interviews. Every solution that you're looking at has a problem. And every problem that you're looking at has edges. Uh, your tools, your processes, all of that intersects with somebody else. Like your API, someone else is ingesting it, right? You need to sit down and talk with them and understand their context in order to truly benefit, in order to truly understand the scope of the problem that you want to solve and like what opportunities are there. You might be thinking about fixing your side of the problem, but when you talk to other people, you might realize that you can solve five other problems at the same time. Uh, so, the very that very first change that I did, the problem set was that our consultants would put all of their notes on a customer in this ancient, ancient wiki that we had built. Uh, sales put all the information on the customers that they got in Salesforce, and support was putting it in their support queue. And so they couldn't see what each other was doing. Even though they were working with the same client, uh, they had no idea what they had been told before the sale 
while the consultant was on site or if there were active bugs when it came up to, for time for renewal. So that was the problem space that I was at. Uh, the very first stakeholder interview, you want to, again, what Lilia said, you don't want to use leading questions. You, want to be, you don't want to come in and go like, I know what the problem is. Do you agree with me that the problem is the problem? What you want to ask is questions like, tell me about how you interact with this today. What are the steps? What are the things that take a long time? What are the things that suck your will to live out of your chest? Uh, ask them, what are the things that absolutely must stay the same? Otherwise, they'll you know, flip a table and set the building on fire. Like You don't want that. So find out what those things are. Uh, write down everything. Ask them their hopes, their dreams. Like if, if the world were a perfect shiny place, would your software wash your dishes for you? Probably write it down. But then come back and be like, okay, we're going to evaluate whether the things on this list are absolutely must-haves. If you break this, I will break you. Uh, nice to have. So if you improve this, you'll be improving my life, and I will appreciate that. Versus, probably can't do this, but if you could, I'd like it. Like, sort, have them help you rank those. Now, I do want to be clear that this is not requirements gathering. This is opportunity uh, spelunking. Don't make any promises here. Don't promise them that it's going to wash their dishes for them. Just say that you're looking at the problem space and trying to understand all the opportunities that are available for you. Uh, also, as much as we would like to have an ideologically pure, like, ah, oh, I will understand the problem space first, and then I'll come up with a solution, a lot of us already have like a little idea in the back of our heads. Maybe we saw a talk, and we're like, oh man, I, I did this, I implemented this fix, it would work, right? Keep that to yourself. What you want to do is uh, just find out what they've got, and don't feel like, oh yeah, no, I'm totally going to do that for you. Um, they are giving you a present when they are telling you what they want, what they fear, what wakes them up at night. And so when you say, ah, oh, yes, I've already thought about that, you're kind of projecting that. And you're going to be able to come back to this later. Even if you're already planning on doing it, save that nugget. Uh, why, are, why are we even doing these interviews? You are building up your awareness case. So be aware of the problems and the desires that your end users have for your change. All right, so you've done your initial stakeholder interviews. You want to come back and make sure whatever you're working on, it should be fallible. If you're going to roll out a change and it's going to break everybody else's stuff, it's a bad change. Don't do it. You're just going to leave, it's just going to drive resentment. It's going to make the next change harder to fix. So kind of like lay that out and be like, hey, I'm going to do my best. We are not going to roll out a change. It's going to harsh your mellow. Uh, follow up with those stakeholders once you know what you're going to do before you launch it. Say, here's the plan we've got. You asked for this and this and this, and we're going to be able to get that for you. But also tell them the things that you can't do. Like, I know you really, really wanted this nifty dashboard, but it turns out, give them their context. So you wanted this, but sales needed this, and their business case was greater. So like, we weighed it very heavily, and it, we're going to roll out with this one first. Is that OK with you? What you're doing here is you're giving them the context so that when you do launch this and the rest of their friends are like, oh, man, they didn't have that dashboard, they're going to be like, yeah, but you know, sales had this da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and they told us maybe we can fix it later. Um, you are helping to create an evangelist as opposed to an enemy. Who wants an enemy when they're rolling on change? <laughs> um, when you're doing this follow-up, give them credit for the ideas they had. They said they wanted this. Yeah, you thought of it first, but you were also thinking of the problem space first. Give them credit. Thank you for that idea. We're going to do it. Uh, it's like the IKEA thing, right? Maybe it's a pretty half-done chair, but if you need it, it's awesome. It's got like, like I don't know, plus eight charisma or something. Uh, see if you can get consensus, like, hey, we're rolling this out. Are you cool with this? Did we forget anything? Did we break the thing we didn't intend to? Oh. Look out for new stakeholders. 
So that initial change is probably one of my deepest scars. And I mentioned that our consultants put all of their uh, trip reports into this really crusty old wiki. It took like 20 seconds for a page to load. Everything was just buried in these weird crevices. No one could find anything. <laughs> and so this tool we were going to roll out was like if Facebook and a wiki had a business baby, that's what it was. And so I was like, oh man, this is going to be like, we're going to replace that really crappy old wiki. And it, obviously, it's going to be a win. Uh, but what I neglected to think about is who else is a stakeholder? Because of the solution we chose, our stakeholders actually changed. Because HR used that wiki, product, engineering, UX, everybody used that wiki. And I didn't talk to everyone. I only talked to our little quadrant. And so, uh, yeah, how did this turn out? So I'm getting ready to launch our solution to the entire company because it was really good. And like the night before, they're like, you can only launch it to your side of the business. Because unbeknownst to me, the other side of the company was also working on replacing this wiki. And they had already gotten further. But because I hadn't done stakeholder interviews and found this out, I didn't know. And it doomed the whole project. So, don't get that scar. Constantly reevaluate your stakeholders. Talk to everyone you possibly can. Uh, if you're not a talkative person, find someone who is a talkative person and enlist their help. All right, so you've done your homework. You have come up with your plan. You have run it by all of your stakeholders. Now it's time to roll out your solution. Start with the tigers. What are the terrifying things that are going to happen if we do not do this change? You really want to go for emotional impact here. I know we're a bunch of nerds and like talking about emotions is uncomfortable, but here's the thing. If you calmly and logically explain that someone should get out of their sleeping bag, unzip their tent, maybe put on their shoes, maybe not, it depends on how sensitive your feet are, and then run as quickly as you can the other way, they're going to be halfway inside the tiger's mouth by the time you get to that point that you're telling them to run away, like wake people up. Uh, you really want to go for emotional impact. Charts are nice. Spreadsheets, as much as I love them, not so much, unless they're really, really red. <laughs> but what, you, what works really well are physical representations. Like if you can have a pile of things that you are wasting with an inefficient process, or maybe you're like, hey, look at all these Hot Wheels. Each of these Hot Wheels is represents the cost of a Tesla. That's how much we're wasting with the process. Like, that'll make an impact. You really want to find something that they can think of, that they're not seeing a million of every day. You don't see a pile of Hot Wheels every day, but you see a million spreadsheets. Um, recent examples are the best kind of tigers. So you want to point to be like, hey, do you want to have a security breach? Like, this has been in the news. Point to things that they've seen even better things they've personally experienced. So stakeholder interviews, tell me about a time when you like woke up in the middle of the night and had the worst day ever. What was the cause of that? If we're gonna fix that. You don't want that tiger waking you up in the middle of the night. So awesome. Future threats are also good. Uh, some of the clearest future threats are actually government mandates, so ACA or GDPR. Those are really big tigers. You have to address those. Uh, competition, are your competitors coming to eat your lunch? And my personal favorite is misalignment with self-identity. Uh, please raise your hand if hypocrite is the best word that you can apply to yourself. <laughs> Anybody dream of one day being called a hypocrite? Uh, like, it kind of makes my spine melt when I think about it. But as a human and as a company, you have a sense of identity. Maybe you are customer driven and you do, you will bend over backwards to make sure that the customer has a good experience. Maybe you're a first in class engineering uh, org and you are going to be cutting edge bleeding and, well, not bleeding, bleeding edge. Um, uh, what are the things that you all identify with? Without doing this change, are we actually jeopardizing that? Are we risking our customer security without this new change? That is a really, really 
good, terrifying motivator. Um, so like for, for the Facebook wiki baby, uh, one of the things I, I liked at Puppet were like, hey, we're friendly, we like each other, we do cool stuff. Uh, so it's not just going to be us talking about you know, what module we implemented on site. It's also going to be like, Tiffany's got karaoke going. Who wants to learn about karaoke? Uh, new, yeah, who wants to learn about karaoke? Okay. Um, but it was the way, like, we are friendly people, and this will enable us to be friendlier. This is more of a design. Anyway. Um, oh, no, for us, the tiger was, why aren't we automating this? Why does someone have to go through three different tools and log in to see customer data? That is not who we are. We automate things. This is, we are bad people for allowing ourselves to be hypocrites this way. And that was the tiger there. Um, but the happy things. Right after the tigers, we move to the puppies. What are the great things that are going to happen once we roll out this change? Um, again, you're going for something that's meaningful to them. As much as I wish that data quality was a motivating puppy, it's not. What is motivating, though, is being able to go home on time with like a clear head because you were able to deliver on time because you didn't have to go back and do rework because you missed a deadline for the customer because the data that went in was bad because you had poor data quality. You want something that is meaningful for the end person. Okay, so again, you're going to go back to those stakeholder interviews and find out what, was, what were the things they really wished that their day looked like. Is it easier work, less work? The work that they are doing is more interesting? Um, continued employment, I want to be clear, this is not like if you don't take up my new tool, you're fired. Um, a lot of us don't even have that capability. Uh, it's more about being, we like working with each other. We should continue, we should go out this change so we get to continue working with each other because we like each other and stuff we're working on. It's cool. All right. Uh, yeah, and again, the we like karaoke and having fun together. Let's organize a magic tournament in Facebook wiki. Uh, the greater good, like the world being a good citizen what, in whatever community you're in is also a really good thing. Third, not first, not second. Third is knowledge. Never, ever start here. Again, if you start with the details, people are going to like fall asleep or they're going to panic. Uh, neither of which are good for getting people to be like, I, I want to listen to what this person has to say and do what they tell me to do. Uh, how many people here have seen someone at work come up and explain that when they get, when they discover a bug, they need to file a ticket, and there's now going to be a new checkbox uh, or a drop down, and you mark whether it was customer discovered or if it was found in testing, da da da, da and six months from now, when we have all this data, we'll have a dashboard and we'll be able to make some decisions. But six months from now, no one even knows why that checkbox is there, much less have used it. Who's seen that? Who's done that? <laughs> yeah, never ever start here. Uh, my manager once told me uh, to move the desks from one side of the office to the other. And having my Marine Corps back, I'm like, okay, cool. Let's optimize the decision on where people sit. And here is how, who moves first so that we don't have a traffic jam. And so I sent out the email telling people when they were going to move their desks and to where. And the first thing they said was, why? I, I, I had no idea. <laughs> They're like, this is a terrible idea. I love this seat. I, the window is here, but you'll have a window there. Yeah, but this tree has like this bird. Like, I am BFS with this bird now. You're going to move me away from my friend. Um, it was a baffling day for me, and a, but a very good lesson that I've taken with me since. Uh, and also, uh, reading the flipping manual is one of the worst things you can do. Uh, yeah. Who, has, who here is familiar with learning styles? Okay. For those of you that aren't, it's basically saying not all of us learn the same way. Some of us are really, really good with the manual. And when we tell people to read that manual, 
We are saying, I only want people who learn the exact same way as me in this room. <laughs> we end up excluding people when we give that answer. We make it harder for people to learn and participate and feel good about themselves at work. So, here are some types of learning styles. Only a few of these apply to what we traditionally think of as computer science educational materials, logical and verbal. Like, we think in words, we read manuals, we go hack on stuff. Uh, but there are so many other ways. Like, this is, this is a nice verbal way of showing it, but maybe you're a more visual person, and having something like this will show you that solitary and group are actually a whole subset of what type of learning you like. And I'm not saying you need to come up with a different way of teaching every single individual human, because you can like do this in parallel. My personal favorite is having a training when I launch, and then recording that training. Like I'm writing the docs as I'm building the tool, but then when I have a class, people who learn best in groups get to have that. People who learn best by getting hands-on get to walk through it in that class. Uh, people who do better when they hear things get to hear me walking them through that. People who want to read it are just going to read the docs, or people who are solitary are just going to watch the video. Just record a classroom. That's all it takes. All right. Uh, then, ability. You want to be able to point to someone and be like, you want to be like Mike. Hopefully Mike is someone that they like and can see themselves being. Uh, so don't choose like a super genius that nobody really understands. That's, that doesn't feel... They won't feel able to be the super genius. You want to show the team they like has already implemented your new process. And then you're going to list out what are the things that they do. It's not just be like Mike. It's like when Mike reaches a problem, here's how he troubleshoots it. Does this, this, and this. And by getting very detailed into there, people are better able to imagine themselves doing the steps that will make them like Mike. That being said, the simplest changes are often the uh, easiest. So rather than having like three secret handshakes in order to get access to this one thing to flip the toggle, uh, in change management, this is often called clearing the path. Make it intuitive to use the tool. Uh, talk with UX people if you have them handy. Because uh, we all like the fiddly bits. That's why we're in tech. Like, we like going in and like figuring out how to tweak our thing to make it do the thing that we want to do. But we only like our fiddly bits. Who wants to know the fiddly bits for, who wants to have to think about the fiddly bits that the finance team needs to do to make sure their spreadsheets work? Like, that's their job, right? We only want our fiddly bits. Uh, and, oh, yes. Be like Mike, clear the path. Make sure management is blessed with this, because if management says you can't do this, the employees no longer have the ability to do the change, even if they know how. Uh, and then subvert imposter syndrome. One of the things I rolled out was an HR information system to the company. And the tool we chose, we chose because it was dead simple to use. An employee who like never watched any of the training videos could log in look at the available drop-downs and be like, oh, boom, I just fixed my direct deposit account. The end, never has to talk to a person, feels good about themselves, stuff gets done, yay, except. There was this one part that was just awful. Uh, the time management section. If you were su submitting your timesheets, if you were an hourly employee, you could submit your timesheet and look fine. It looked like it was from 1996, but like, you knew what was going on. Uh, but if you were the manager and had to approve that timesheet, I, it was so bad. Like, nobody knew how to get to any different part of it. You had to, like, reach around your elbow to scratch your back, um, and we knew it was bad. So everyone in the company knows that when you have a problem, you go to Confluence to look for the answer. So what we did for that, knowing that it was bad, is we start off at the top of the page, I'm sorry, it's not you. You are okay. You are on this page. Here's a picture of a baby monkey. Look at this gift for as long as you need. 
And then you can move in, and we have all the screenshots for the secret handshakes and flirting toggles. Uh, but let people know that it's not them. If they feel bad about themselves when they try to do the thing you ask them to do, they're not going to do it. They're going to like avoid it at all costs, which means they're not going to adopt your change. So put kitten pages everywhere. Hooray, you launched it. Everyone knows how to do it. Everyone's on board. We're done, right? I, we're, it's not. It's going to be there for, unless it's just a one-time thing. If it, you're going to continue using this change, you need to remind people because we are human. We have so many family bits we've got to worry about. How are you going to remember yours? So, uh, it's a commitment. I just want to say that this is a commitment like a relationship. This is a puppy wedding hit puppet. Uh, so, much like having date night, you should schedule. Uh, backlog grooming sessions with those initial stakeholders you interviewed to figure out what you want to do next. Put it on your calendar. We often say we're going to like come back to this, but then we don't. Commit. Also, metrics are awesome. Not just because they show that this is a good change, it's going up and to the right, uh, but when you get that email saying, look at this good change, you're like, oh, crap, I forgot. I need to go do that too. So it's a good reminder, iteration, Hey, we heard you said this thing wasn't the best way we rolled it out, so we listened to you. We heard what you were saying, and because we care about you, we fixed it. And here's the fix. We'll help, again, build more trust and empathy and, like, faith. Uh... Iteration. Oh, if you're able to see, like, I need all of my development teams to do this, to roll out this new pipeline, you can go back and be like, Hey, installer team, why don't, haven't you done this? Do you need help? Like, go through the checkbox. And make sure your onboarding materials are good, because new people are a font of enthusiasm. If you can get them feeling good about your thing, if they can be productive right off the bat, they're going to be a fan of your thing and remind their team and other people they talk to that it's actually a really cool thing, and you should do it too. Uh, and if you have the capability of end of life and support for the old way of doing it, Go ahead and do that. Don't be a jerk about it. Just be like, hey, this isn't going to work in another couple months. <sighs> summary slide time. So if you are someone who likes taking pictures of summary slides, here they are. All right, reminder, aware to make sure your change is adopted, be sure that your audience is aware of the problem. Point out the large, scary tigers. Make sure that your desire, or Desire is there. A fix is actually wanted. Uh, make sure they know how to do the thing. Clear, varied instructions. You need to be able to be like Mike and remind people, because we're human, if you have enjoyed this topic and want to read more, here are some books that I think are really nice. I'm going to count to ten uh, so that you can take a photo of them. And one day, when you figure out something that takes ten seconds to say, <laughs> I can't actually count when I'm talking, so um, I'm going to pretend I get 10. All right. Thank you, Chicago. Uh, this has been Change Change for, for Humans. I love you.